Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Today's Restaurant News Networking Group 2 meeting. We are a group of vendors in the restaurant industry, and we are here to help each other and to help restaurateurs who may have a question or concern and uh, need some information. We're here to help in any event. Uh, if you want to contact us, please call us at 561-620-8888 or go on our website, trnusa.com, and you can check us out on YouTube on Today's Restaurant, and you can go to that site and like, like us or uh, subscribe so you'll get a, a notification when we put up a new video. So we have a guest speaker today. I think I'll, I'll let me just give, give Matt, uh, let you guys know who Matt is. Matt is a cybersecurity expert who has protected businesses' networks from internal and external threats for the past 30 years. He's currently the Managing Director and Chief Information Security Officer for IT Fusion with offices in Plantation and Coral Springs. Previously, Matt worked in IT departments for companies such as Kinko's, Alamo, National Car Rental, and Office Depot. Today, he's going to be sharing the top five security risks for the restaurant industry along with practical tips to mitigate these risks. Welcome, Matt. Thank you for coming. Thank you. I well, think, would you like, would you like to have the group give you their intros first or you want, you want to do it first? Yeah, I'd love to, love to understand a little bit more about yeah. it. Okay, so here. Rick, start us up. Just give us, you know, who, what, where, and what. Morning, Rick Israel with Affiliated Health Insurance, doing business as the Israel Agency. We are an independent insurance company that helps individuals coming off group plans going into the Medicare space. And we also help individuals or employers help their employees get insurance through the Affordable Care Act if they do not offer insurance there. Um, I'm based in Huntsville, Alabama. And at the end, you will receive my information by email with my phone number and email address. Thank you. Uh, I think I mentioned this to you, Matt. At the end of the meeting, I'll send everybody this here. A spreadsheet with all the contact information so you'll have all of it ed good morning good morning this is ed gurton with seco sales in orange park florida and we're an equipment supply company that specializes in frozen dessert equipment so we have batch freezers soft serve machines quick whip machines uh mixed treat machines display cases slushy machines yogurt machines uh, my number is 904 334-4489. We represent companies Carpajani, ISA, BGI, uh, and a couple of other small Spanish companies that manufacture uh, equipment for the horror industry. Thank you. Thank you. Brian, good morning. Morning, everybody. Brian with uh, Rogue Financial Group. We're a commercial equipment financing company to uh, all industries from startups to existing business. Uh, I can be reached at 404 723 7222. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Ivo, good morning. Good morning. My name is Ivo Rovaris, calling from uh, Deerfield Beach, Florida. I work for PNC <laughs> about six years. My focus as a business banker is, of course, business solutions, lending, and much more. PNC is now the fifth largest bank in America, and your focus now, one of those important focus is restaurants. That's why I'm here to hear more from you, team, and create special solutions. Again, this is Ivo, PNC Bank. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Terry, good morning. Good morning, Terry. Today's Restaurant News. I um, handle the... Uh, I, I'm sorry, I handle the uh, monthly leads report. We have a restaurant report leads that are second to none anywhere in the United States. And what we do is we give you a list of upcoming, under construction, planned, uh, pre-construction um, list every month of about uh, 40 to 70. This month, it happens to be 80 brand new leads every month. 
uh, of things that are going up. We give you owners' names, phone numbers, addresses, email addresses, very important, about the time they're opening, square footage, um, and a lot of extra detailed information. Um, you, if you want a sample, just reach out to me, Terry at trnusa.com. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Chris, good morning. We're not hearing you, Chris. And now we're not seeing you. He's he's at the beach. There he is. Okay. He's scuba diving. He's at the beach. He's scuba diving. He's looking for lobsters up there. He's always at the beach. <laughs> Last week he was at Crystal. <laughs> he's at the beach in Valdelia, Georgia. We're not hearing you for whatever reason, Chris. Chris, we're not hearing you. All right. So we're going to go to uh, Joe Cregan. Good morning. Uh, good morning, Joe Cregan with Kai Payment Services uh, in Fort Lauderdale, actually, Davie, Florida. I think I actually pay your company about one seventy-five a month, Matt. I do fusion for backup router, backup wire, backup four G router. Okay, from your I forget the guy's name, your IT guy, right? Yeah. Anyway, uh, I'm based in Day downtown Davie. I I'm a ISO for Pfizer, formerly First Data Credit Card Processing Global POS System. And we also we sell ADP payroll. We support about 750, 800 accounts here, and mostly in Florida, and mostly restaurants with their point of sale and payment processing needs. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Are you and Chris on the same beach? Uh, he's probably on the Gulf. I'm on the Atlantic. <laughs> <laughs> Chris is on the Savannah River. There you go. All right. Well, I'll tell you what Chris does. Chris is a uh, recruiter. He's been a recruiter for over 30 years. He finds uh, people to fit the jobs that are, are available, and he's excellent at what he does. And I don't have your phone number handy immediately, but we'll, we'll get you on somehow. Uh, just go. <laughs> uh, Steve, Steve Whitehill, good morning. Tell us quickly what you, who you are and what you do. Are you on the beach too? <laughs> Steve, of, you're up. Bums here. Tell us who you are, what you do, quick, because oh, we have I'm, a speaker. I'm Steve Whitehill. I am uh, a business broker. I help people buy and sell businesses. You can reach me at Steve at anchorbb.com or on my phone, 561 376 7500. Okay. Um, I'm Howard Appel. I'm the founder and publisher of Today's Restaurant News, and I'm your host at our meetings. And again, I want to introduce our speaker for today, Matt Kinsey, with uh, a cybersecurity company called uh, IT Fusion. And uh, I spoke to, to uh, Matt very briefly on the phone last week, and I uh, I think he's got a tremendous amount of information for the restaurant industry. I was excited to hear about it. He's got some information on things that are coming. So, uh, Matt, the floor is yours. Thank you, Howard. And thank you all for being here this morning. Hopefully this will do this. I, I focus this on items in the restaurant industry. Some of them are specific to restaurants, uh, but many of these apply to every business. So... Let me just go ahead and get my screen up. Hey, is the screen visible? Yep. Okay. Uh, so a little bit about me. Um, I'm a former IT architect for Office Depot, uh, currently in Boca. I left right before they moved back into Boca from Delray Beach. Uh, I've got a master's in computer information systems. Um, Cybersecurity expert. My mission is to protect South Florida businesses from cybercrime. Um, calling it hackers, which yes, we use the term hackers all the time, but they're really cyber criminals. They're they're criminals and they're stealing your money. They're just doing it from behind the safety of their computer. We're going to go into each of these topics a little bit, but a little bit about our business. So, what our business does is we provide IT and network management, cybersecurity. Compliance, we'll talk a little bit about compliance. And then for larger companies, we provide what's called a virtual chief security officer. So that's a fractional chief security officer, much like a company might have a fractional chief financial officer or chief sales officer. 
So what are the top five risks for restaurants? And, and four of these are the same for any business, okay? Um, so hackers, hackers are the number one threat. Whether they're internal or external, doesn't really matter. Um, POS malware. So if you're working with point of sale systems, they are very attractive to hackers. And we'll talk a little bit, we're gonna go into more detail on each of these. Ransomware, insider threats and Wi-Fi security. Wi-Fi security, especially in the restaurant industry, is critical to get resolution on, especially as we're seeing more and more wireless devices being used to process credit cards. It used to be they had to take your credit card and go to the back and then swipe it, and now they're doing it with a device in front of your table. And so that securing those is very important. So why do hackers like restaurants? Well, one, restaurants typically have weak security. They often don't think about security. They just have computers. They want to run their point of sale. Uh, they might have one or two computers in the back office managing payroll, managing scheduling, uh, managing orders. And so they don't maintain them well. They don't provide patching. Um, the other thing is business email compromise. So how many of you, Howard said he just got one. You know, how many of you have gotten a, an email that su was supposedly from somebody you normally do business with? And it wasn't really from them. Yeah. yeah. So learning how to do that. And we're working with a company in Boca Raton last year because of a business email compromise, compromise is in the middle of a $100 million lawsuit because money was transferred on a closing uh, on a commercial real estate deal to the wrong account because of a business email compromise. They target the point of sale system because that's where the money is flowing through. They don't really care about the data, um, unlike some companies. Your company, especially if you're in the finance industry or the insurance industry, they want the data. In the restaurants, what they want are the credit card numbers. And they want to intercept the credit card numbers and intercept the credit card processing. So the second area is POS malware. And again, they're targeting the data, but specifically the credit card data. If they can capture the data as it's going through the point of sale system, then they use that to create fake credit cards and go out and run those credit cards online or in person. Because of the way POS systems are run, usually there, you know, there may be a touch screen, uh, they may use mag cards to swipe in, but people aren't using them and they typically don't notice things. Like you would notice on your computer if all of a sudden things slowed down because something was running in the background you would notice pop-up messages. Because of the way point of sale systems operate, they come to the front and they force themselves to stay in the front on the computer. So pop-up messages may not be noticed for weeks or months. They often also don't reboot the systems on a regular basis. They bypass the firewall. So firewalls are a great thing to have in your business. They protect you from external threats and from data leaving your system inappropriately. But because the malware is sitting on a trusted device, like a point of sale, the POS malware can often bypass the firewall. The next area is ransomware. Hopefully none of you have had ransomware, but we've worked with numerous companies to get them through ransomware and to protect them. What ransomware does is it sends typically an email or sometimes it's a website and they want you to click on a link and then that downloads a little program. The program starts running and encrypts your files. And then they'll demand payment. The average in 2022 on a paid ransomware claim was over $250,000. <laughs> now, you know, how, how many of you have $250,000 cash sitting around to pay a ransomware claim or have the cyber insurance to pay that claim? Restaurants typically do not. You know, they're a small margin business. It's very hard to survive. This will put a restaurant out of business very quickly. The fourth area is insider threats. And it's quite often disgruntled employees. So you've got somebody who's been working really well and they got written up. They got a bad customer complaint and now they're up and they don't like the way that the manager dealt with it. So now they're upset. And what do they want to do? They want to get back. 
And so they're going to look for ways to get in. In the restaurant industry, there are cyber criminals who will target servers and offer to pay them $25,000, $100,000 to put something, to insert a USB stick into a POS system to try to put malware on it. And if they get in, the guys will get paid. Now think about a server at a restaurant. You offer a server at a restaurant $50,000. How many of them are going to say no to that? That's more than they're making in many restaurants for the year. And so it's very tempting, especially for a disgruntled employee. It actually represents 50% of all threats. <clears throat> area, and, and one of the most significant in the restaurant industry is Wi-Fi security. So if you ever gone into a restaurant, they had an open Wi-Fi network. You didn't need a password to log in. There was no login screen where you had to put your information in. That You just got right on the network. I, I was at one yesterday. I saw it was open. Now, I never joined those because I don't trust them. They, have, they also have networks with very weak security. They'll put the phone number as the password for the network. And what this has to do is what was called rogue wireless devices or man-in-the-middle attacks. This also happens at airports. What they do is they set up their own wireless device and they intercept the signal using the same SSID. That's the, the tag that tells you the name of the network. That's what you see on your phone when you connect to a network. And they intercept the data, read all of the data as it goes across the, the wire, across the air, and then they pass it on. So what they're trying not to do is they're just trying to read everything. So that's where they get credit card numbers and expiration dates and all of the information that's available on the mag stripe that gets passed across comes across with that. So now they can create a new device with a new chip or a new mag stripe. So rogue wireless devices are incredibly dangerous on a network and there are ways to protect from that. So I wanna see if there are any questions on the threats before we get into the framework and how we would protect that. Not I have any. a couple of questions, but I'm gonna wait until you're finished. Okay, it's up to you. I can take them now or we can wait. Okay, well, I have one of my biggest questions and I think about this all the time um, is I get emails from myself. It's the exact same email. And I look for something in the body, in the, in the top part of it, and there's nothing there. It's coming from me, but it's not. Right. How, are they, how can they do that? So what they're, they're doing what's called spoofing, and, and it's very similar to a spoofed phone number. So on a, on a phone number, you can overwrite your phone number with another tag. And this is a good thing on a point of sale system. If you've got multiple phone lines coming in, you want all of them to show the same phone number so that people aren't calling the second or third line. You want them to call the main line for the office. So they tag every phone line out with the same phone number. We do that here at our office. Everyone who works on our help desk has one number that shows up. Everybody else has another number that shows up. Well, cyber well, that's a, And that applies to emails as there, well? There are very easy ways to do that. So what you actually have to do is you have to look at the header information on the email. I, I do want it all. It all has my name on it. No, it doesn't gotta, make any sense. You've got to decrypt. You've got to read through all and of the those decryption. Files. Right. Okay. And figure all that right. out. Thank now, you. the other possibility is that they did get into your email. And so I, I change my password on my email every 30 days. Hmm. If I get something like that, I'll change it early. Okay. Okay, just to make sure, um, and there are ways to track that, especially if you're using Office 365 or Google Business Suite. If you're using a free email system, it's a little more difficult. Or okay. if you're using the one that came from your ISP, it may be a little more difficult. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. All right, so the National Institute of Standards and Technology, which is an industry some of you may be familiar with, that's a government body um, government-sponsored body that defines standards for technology across all sorts of industries. So everything from electrical cords to um, watches and phones, they create technology. 
technology standards for interoperability. So on Wi-Fi, the 802.11 started with the NIST uh, National Institute of Standards of Technology definition. Well, NIST has created a cybersecurity framework, which is based on an international ISO standard. And what this says is that there are five key components to cybersecurity. The first thing we want to do is we want to identify risks. Now, this is a manual process because this is, requires you to think about what could happen. And what we'll do is we do what's called a tabletop exercise. And we go through and say, okay, so what happens if this occurs? And then what would happen next? What would happen next? We think through this. There are also data sources. There are news sources out there. AT&T, Alien Vault is one that's out there that's very good. Um, Virus Total is another one that's very good. And we subscribe to those and they identify risks for us. And so they're, they've got their fingers out everywhere, like Terry does with restaurant leads. They consolidate these risks and they help us identify what those risks are. The second thing we want to do is protect from the risks. So we want to put in reasonable protections. Now, let's be completely transparent. If a cyber criminal has the means and the resources and specifically targets your business, the chances are very high that they will get in. They will figure out some way to get in despite all the security you are in. And it's just like somebody robbing an uh, art museum. You know, art museums have some of the best security in the world, and yet things are still stolen from art museums. But that's requiring somebody who's specifically targeting something in that art museum that they want to get. So what we're trying to do is most hackers out there, the vast majority are, are like these kids who walk down the street and check to see if your car door is open. And if your car door is open, they get in, they rifle through, and they take anything of value, but they're not going to smash the window. All right. Then there's another group that will smash the window and grab what they can and leave. What we're trying to do is make it, we're leaving the doors locked and we're putting in stronger windows to protect you from these types of things. So that's the protection piece. The third piece is detect. You have to have monitors and systems in place so that if something is in there, you know it's in there. The average ransomware attack, the cyber criminal is in the system for 60 to 90 days before they pull the trigger and execute their ransomware. The solar winds, you may have heard of the solar wind breach a couple of years ago. They were in solar winds for 18 months undetected before solar winds realized what was going on. The fourth area is respond. So we've got a risk we identified, we've detected that it's in the system, how do we respond? This is policies, this is software tools, that will allow us to go in and try to stop what's occurring and to mitigate the risk further at that point and limit the damage. And then the final area is recover. At times, the only thing left to do is recover your data. And so you want to make sure you have backup systems that are tested on a regular basis. We test our backup systems every day to make sure that we can boot that up in a recovery mode. Every day we do that. We do a full restore twice a year for our corporate clients to make sure that we can actually transfer the data onto another system, not just boot it up in the cloud. So this is the framework we use to respond and keep our customers secure, which would include um, people in the restaurant industry and vendors for restaurants. They're good targets for us. So hackers, how do you respond? Well, one, weak security, you want to assess the technical and physical controls for networks and systems, all right? Is your back office left locked or can somebody just walk into it? I was at a restaurant not that long ago and I went back to the restroom and the network switch was sitting on a shelf between the men's and women's restaurant. restaurant. <laughs> All I would have needed to do is take a device back there and plug into that network switch. And I had access to every device in the network and I was internal. And if they didn't have the right controls in place to identify who was on their network, I could have had full access to their network. They lack maintenance. They don't often have automated maintenance and system patching. 
There are new threats that come out every week. You need to keep those up to date. A lot of times they don't even have antivirus on their point of sale systems because the point of sale vendor will say, oh, antivirus slows us down. Okay. And there are ways to make sure that the, any, the point of sale doesn't get slowed down, but the antivirus is on there for other threats. Uh, business email compromise. We want multi-factor authentication. That's just like bank. And, and I'm sure PNC does this as well. If I log into my bank account from the website, they're going to text me a code or send me a code on an authenticator app that I have to put in in order to get access to my account. And yes, it's a pain in the neck, but it's one more way to identify that I actually have rights to get into that account. And then we also look for email filtering solutions that look for those emails that don't really come from you, that look for the signs, indicators of compromise that say that this email has been done. The most important asset to secure is the point of sale in a restaurant in particular. In a typical network office, it's going to be the owner's computers. It's going to be the server in the back room, if you have a server in the back room. And it's going to be your cloud applications, whichever cloud applications you're using. So that's what we want to make sure we take care of with hackers. So POS malware. Most important thing, and this is true in your business as well, there should your the user that logs onto the computer and runs from a daily basis, whether it's your computer or a point of sale, should not have administrative control. The administrative control should be set up through a separate account. So if you need to install software, if you need to make major system changes, you should log out as yourself, log in as the administrative mm -hmm. user to make those changes. Uh, you want time or some use proximity-based logout. So you know, some restaurants, they give everybody a, a MagStripe card or um, RFID card, and they have to log onto the computer with that. And as soon as they walk away, it logs them off. I've walked up to restaurants where I could get in and get right in the point of sale system because it was sitting in a publicly accessible area and it was logged on. And if I stole one of their shirts, I could be standing there doing whatever I wanted and no one would probably notice because they're so busy taking care of orders, taking orders back to the customers. Um, the other area is what we want to call application white listing. And this, and this works very well on point of sale because there's not that many applications that run on a point of sale. And it makes sure that only the software we know is good is allowed to run. So this is a different approach. Most, most malware's detection looks for signature and says, oh, this is something that looks bad or it's doing something that's funny. We're going to stop it. What whitelisting does is says, I don't know what you are. You can't run. Whether you look bad, whether you're on a list, I just don't know what you are. You haven't been authorized to run on this computer, so you can't run. And then we have ways to control that from the backside. If something does need to run, we can review it make sure it's safe. Third area, ransomware. So there are three major tools to protect against ransomware. One is next generation antivirus. So these are, these are tools that not only look at signatures, but also look at behavior. And they use artificial intelligence or deep analysis, whatever you want to call it, to look at what is this software doing on the computer that's not normal activity. Let's stop that activity. Uh, these are tools you've heard commercials for CrowdStrike. If you listen to Sirius XM, they're on there all the time. Um, so CrowdStrike uses this type of tool. This is that type of tool. Application whitelisting again, and then monitoring from a 24 by 7 security operations center. Uh, and our security operations center is in Dallas. And it's all US-based employees because we have two customers that require that, that there's no data leaving uh, the United States for their purposes. Insider threats. So one is security awareness training. We provide weekly training to our customers with little security tips to make sure they know what's going on. We also have training courses, um, again, removing administrative access and again, the monitoring. So you'll see some of these protect against multiple categories. And then finally, Wi-Fi security. Eliminate 
open networks. That is the most important thing to do. Uh, if you own a restaurant in your business, make sure that every Wi-Fi network is protected with a password encryption at the minimum. Use the latest standards for encryption and login portals. So a lot of those, if you go into Panera, you have to log in and accept their terms and conditions. However, they're not encrypting their data. I don't recommend using uh, uh, Wi-Fi networks at Starbucks, at Panera, at McDonald's, which are probably the three biggest ones that people use because they're not secure. All right. The other thing you want to do is you want to segregate your internal traffic from your guest traffic. Physically segregate them so that the devices on your guest network for your customers cannot access the devices on your internal network that might be running a point of sale, a handheld point of sale, a credit card swiper. Um, they might be transferring other data in your system. And then you want rogue wireless device pr protection and detection. Now, there are some compliance areas in the restaurant industry that you should be aware of, and some of, some of you may have other compliance standards. If you're in the finance sector, uh, whether it's banking or insurance, there are uh, compliance standards. If you're in healthcare, there are compliance standards, um, and there are also industry standards. So cybersecurity insurance is taking over a lot of the compliance. If you're in the restaurant industry, you're dealing with credit cards, highly recommended that you explore cybersecurity insurance. This protects you from cyber terrorism. This protects you from cyber insurance, from cyber risks, and it shifts some of the financial burden from yourself onto another party. Uh, but you have to make sure that you're doing things properly. The biggest one in the restaurant industry, and, and this affects any business that takes credit cards, and Joe is probably familiar with this, but PCI DSS, that's the payment card industry um, security standards. Version 4.0 has just come out and it is mandatory as of approximately a year from now. What we're seeing with the PCI standards is billion dollar banks, multi-billion dollar banks are getting tired of paying for breaches on credit cards, and they're shifting the burden down to the smaller banks. And now the smaller banks are shifting the burden down to the merchant. And it shifts responsibility for protection from fraud down to the merchant. So there are a whole list of requirements that you have to have that require more cyber controls. There are fines if there's a breach and the business is not compliant. So they're going to come in, and if there's a breach and they can track it back to your restaurant, there are fines up to two times amount of the fraud that was directly attributable to your business. So you're not just going to lose the $50 on the credit card transaction. You could potentially lose all of the money that that credit card was charged after the breach. Rogue wireless detection is required under PCI DSS-4. So every restaurant out there, every car dealer, every business that takes credit cards physically in any way, either entering them through a terminal or swiping them on a terminal, are going to be required to follow PCI DSS-4 as of March of 2024. So this is something people in the restaurant industry are going to have to deal with. Now, fortunately, they're used to dealing with compliance standards. There are food safety compliance standards that restaurants need to meet. So this just becomes another compliance area that they're going to have to work on. So what can we do? Well, what I'm going to offer anyone here who wants it is a free level one ransomware readiness test. It's a security assessment. You can visit the link there or you can scan the QR code. It's just uh, we do have a five computer minimum because we can't get good results if you've got less than five computers. And there's no obligation. We'll do the results. And if you want to do anything with this, great. If not, that's fine as well. But the other thing we'd like is introductions to restaurants so that we can come in and do a security assessment, a cybersecurity assessment for us. What are the best restaurants for us? Are, are multi-location locally owned restaurants. 
So the, the franchise restaurants typically have somebody at their corporate office who's responsible for this. And they typically have a contract with a local IT company for local support. However, the multi-location um, restaurants that are locally owned are great referrals for us. A single restaurant, probably not as much. So if you've got somebody that you think could use this, we'd love to talk to them. Um, Joe, uh, I know Wally and Lorenzo, I think you're working with Lorenzo, Joe. Um, he's available for you all the time. Um, if you've got a restaurant that you'd like, that you think uh, could use this, and this can help you as well because you're going to reduce their risk on right. their or make sure they're compliant. We we uh, we pretty much gotten away from Windows and are focusing on Android devices with POS and uh, and it's all in the cloud and the, they're running on static IP and tokenized the credit card. Yeah. So those those are some of the things that we could do for those who aren't as technical. He's talking about different controls that they put in place and right. getting away from Windows, um, especially on a point of sale, is, is generally a good idea. Right. I, I would I would agree with that. Yeah. We've got time for questions. Ed, I, I think you're talking, but we're not hearing you. Matt, Sorry, I've got that. Yeah. Hey, we accept credit cards, but we only accept we don't physically accept the card in our hands. We just get the number off the phone and then type it in. How is that going to be affected by what's coming down the pike? That, that you have access to their credit card. The only way that you, the only way that you can avoid PCI DSS4 is if no one in your office can enter a credit card or swipe a credit card. Okay. And and Joe can tell you when you take those numbers over the yeah. card, you actually get charged it's higher. Really rate. risky. Yeah. Yeah. It's the, it's a higher rate. Yeah. That's correct. Now yeah. there are there are solutions out there, and and Joe might be able to help you with some of those. Yeah. that will give you a portal where the your your customer will need to go in and enter the card information and you can have access it. Right. Yeah, you can put the customer card on yeah. file. I mean, I use your portal, IT Fusion portal, to pay the bill. And uh, right, uh, and uh, so you can have a portal uh, where the card could be on file and secured and tokenized and, mm -hmm. uh, and just do recurring billing or make the payments or something. When, what was that sent out? Yeah. I mean, I pay his bill off his portal, most cases. No, I did not. Yeah. Hey, Matt. So, yes. you know, I'm in the insurance industry. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that they say is that we have to have a bit locker on our computer. Well, they automatically come with bit yeah. locker. Hey, you just you have to. Um, I'm in the middle. Okay. If, if you. Can I call you? Can I call you back in 10 minutes? Brian. <laughs> okay. So, yeah. The only question I have is. Okay, great. Thanks. With the bit okay. locker okay. that I okay. can go ahead and turn on on my computer, yeah. how much extra security is what you offer above BitLocker? Oh, so okay. So so what BitLocker does is it encrypts the data that's sitting at rest on your computer. Okay. So if somebody gets your computer and takes the hard drive out because they don't have your password and everything, they can't read that data off of your computer. However, if they can boot the computer and get in, if they've got the computer and can boot boot it up, then they can get access to that data. So it really protects the data at risk. What we do is is way beyond that. That that's just that that's like locking. That's not even locking the door. That's like hiding the door so people don't see the door. Okay. Right? So what we're doing is we're doing a comprehensive cybersecurity solution that looks at all of them. And so if you think of a cat, so what BitLocker is doing, is it's closing one window in your house. And you think of a castle, and I love the analogy of the castle because they're all different. What do you have around the castle? Well, you typically, you've got a moat. That's one protection. You've got a drawbridge. That's another protection. You've got thick walls. That's another protection. You've got walkways up at the top where they can shoot arrows down on you or drop burning oil down on you. You got what they called murder holes where somebody could drop stuff through the through the gateways where you were walking through. And so they could attack you from the top and you were in a protected area. There's all of these different areas that you need to protect. And BitLocker is just one of those. Okay. 
Can I get the screen back, Matt? Are you finished? Is that, yep. That's your last I one? Okay. Just wanted to go ahead and get that one and go ahead and stop share. If you could, there you go. This one. I have another question. As I walk through airports now, Matt, I find that they have a lot of these very long, thin uh, stores. You're able to walk through these stores, you're able to buy what you want, and you're able to walk out and your credit card, which is in your pocket or your bag, which you you may have several, um, it's automatically charged and you have no idea. How is that even possible? How do they know which one to use and how are they able to obtain that without any signatures or anything else? Well, there, there's a number of different technologies that they're using to do things like that. Um, typically, though, so like the Amazon store is a great example. So yeah. the, the Amazon store, you're actually creating an account with Amazon. They know which card because you told them which card is your default. Just like if you go on Amazon Prime, you might have multiple cards in there. But if you I just do. Yeah. buy now, it goes to your default credit card. All right. And they are using technologies like RFID, um, radio frequency ID tags. And when you put something in your cart, they know. So um, what they're finding is there's actually lo fairly low theft in the Amazon stores because of the technology they're using. Now, there's huge issues with self-checkout. Um, Walmart is having a huge issue with self-checkout. Um, Publix is having it because um, the, they do see they're trying to balance increased theft versus reduced labor costs. And right now, it's still in favor of the reduced labor cost. So the reduced labor is offsetting the increase in 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 um, theft. So that's something that they're they're working on. But RFID is the main technology they're using behind knowing what's in there. But typically, you've got some kind of reader that's tied to your card. And what's interesting now is a lot of companies are going even to like you know where you've got a card, but it's not a separate credit card. It's just your card is tokenized in their account so that charges back to your account kind of like but they're your, only using like your southwest card or your your amazon card or whatever it is they're not and what's the protection of them not using the other cards that are in your wallet i mean if they're they, able to that so like my wallet they can't read my cards in my wallet i have to have it tied to something else on my phone or something like that because oh. my wallet has rfid protection built in okay but if you can't read my wallet and i strongly protect strongly strongly if you don't hear anything else today your your wallets wherever you carry your credit cards they should be rfid protected okay. so that you can't read those from proximity readers okay but the the nice thing in the credit card industry now is and joe mentioned this word before is tokenized so think of your apple pay when i go yeah. and apple pay the merchant my credit card number itself, my account number, is never transmitted. What happens is the chip creates a temporary card number that, that doesn't really look like our 16-digit card number or 15 right. Amex, and it sends that, ties back to my account, but all that's transmitted is that token. And it goes, and oh, charge this token, that, and then the system in the back goes, okay, this token belongs to that account. And that's increased our security tremendously. And that's why um, they, want, they want you to swipe. Uh, you know, they want you to insert the chip more than swiping. They want you to use the touch, the touchless more than- Which is what I use. I use the touchless, not the swiping. I don't want to put my card in right. if I don't have to. Exactly. Okay, so great. Thank you. Definitely. Um, great, great question on that. Thank you. I, I've got a question. You mentioned before that uh, if you see something that comes through that's not yours, you change your password. You change your password every 30 days. Uh, this may be a silly question, but what's the best way to keep track of all your passwords? So there are password managers out there. Do not, if you are using LastPass, get off of it. And I don't care if they come after me. They've had three major breaches and they're 
last breach included access to data. So I can back up what I'm saying 100%, but there are we provide a solution to our customers, uh, but there are others out there that are really good. Bitwarden is an open source one, and the premium version is like 10 bucks a year. So it's like, it's nothing. Um, Bitwarden is really good, OnePass. I mean, uh, there are a number of password management. And then all you have to do is remember one password, and then it will generate a password for you for these other accounts. And when you need to log in, it will help you log in through the password manager. That's what we need, Terry. You no, know, well, I type all mine up and I keep them in a drawer and I take them off the computer. So that way every time, because we have so many different passwords and, and um, if I need it, I just go, if I travel, I carry it in my bag. <laughs> and and so if you if your bag is stolen. I know. It's not going to be stolen, trust me. Before I let one of my bags be stolen, I'll shoot. No. <laughs> I'm kidding. But you're right. You're absolutely right. Yeah, I mean, for the $10 a year or whatever it is, it's it's worth it. Well, it's not even that. But again, like Matt said, okay, that's a good point. However, that company now has all your passwords. What happens if something happens to them? Yeah, and that's what's happened with LastPass. That's uh, what I'm saying. Yeah, so great idea. Good but it's not worth putting all your passwords into one place on the computer. So, so one of the problems with the way, one of the problems was some of the way that LastPass created their stuff that even allowed that to happen if they got the database. There are others out there like Bitwarden. Even if someone got the database, they can't read my individual passwords. Right. Okay, great. So, so okay. there are other architectural ways to do that. And, and they wouldn't be able to decode it. It's, so it's decoded very well. Yes. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Can you put some of those recommendations into the chat or Howard, if you could distribute it at some point, that'll be great. Yeah. Yeah. I'll get it. I'll get a list to Howard and then uh, he can just go ahead and distribute that out to everybody. Um, I have a question for you. Is, you know, I guess it's, I don't know if you call it cyber or whatever, but um, back in December, I, paid um well our company paid a um our bank that we work with paid a vendor a check and the vendor asked us to mail the check so typically we would like to do ach and wires right. which is more secure right so i don't uh I'm trying to figure out the mind of a criminal all right so <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That shouldn't be too hard for you. <laughs> okay, so so the there's a company in Brookville, Florida. I won't name the vendor. So the checks go out, our check goes out, other people's checks go out. And I get a call from the vendor about Three weeks later, said we haven't got a check. I said, well, we mailed it. Well, here's everything, okay? So to find out, the guy didn't tell me. The vendor said that they're, they've been having some theft with their mail, okay? And the mail, and one of our checks was stolen. Our check was stolen with a bunch of others, okay? And, you know, it was, he lost about $200,000 worth of in checks so somehow the uh the guy that stole these checks i got a police report on these other checks that were stolen that the guy got from the vendor I'm still waiting to find out information on ours okay but he was able to open bank accounts with their name with their name um of their business and one of the banks was jp morgan so, I mean, so I guess there's death on people stealing people's mail too. So, and opening up banks and bank accounts in their name. Brian, let me just butt in here for a second. Uh, we used to deal with JP Morgan all the time. I had another company that we had an issue with the checks. The checking account was breached. They sent us a, a new checking account number and routing number, a new okay. checking account number. Before I received the new checks, someone had duplicated that checking yeah. account number and routing number with their own name on it. 
right. and we're depositing checks. Right. And, checks. and there were oh. cashing checks until I had to put fraud protection on there. So now the same guy, if I don't enter the check number with all the information, it gets bounced. So just this past week, there was another, another $19,000 check that was written. It was cashed and the next day it was reversed. Okay. So I, I don't know what JP Morgan is, but I, I got to tell you, I've had issues with them the same thing. Okay. All right. Cool. I appreciate it. Yeah. So, so you asked about the mind of the cyber. The mind of the cyber criminal is lazy. Okay. Most cyber <laughs> criminals out there are, are lazy. And, and I'm not saying that in a 95% uh, of what they do is automated. Mm -hmm. So people are like, well, I'm not a target. It, do it doesn't matter. You're no, you, you're not a specific target. You're a general yeah. target. And if That's you right. leave the door open, they're going to come in. Yeah. Right. So close the door and the automated systems don't find them. The, the guy you can't protect against is the guy who is specifically targeting you. And we had a customer a few years ago, his, his brother, well, I know we're recording this, so I'll be very careful in how I say this. His brother was connected to a Russian family organization, Ooh. okay, uh, and, and owed them money. And they were going after his family members. Hmm. So he paid the money back. Okay, so we would literally get him fixed, and the next day he was he was broken into, and we actually had to take him completely off the internet for two weeks, so that he could they could work, and we gave them a completely new internet solution that looked nothing to do with them, so that they couldn't find them, while we got the issue resolved until his brother paid the money back because he was targeted. Those you're not going to be able to stop. But the people who are the casual, that's what we want to do is make it more difficult and and they're going to move on to an easier opportunity that's going to take them less work. Well, I, I, Matt, I want to tell you that personally, I learned so much this morning from your presentation. I, uh, I really appreciate you coming in to talk to us. Uh, it's terrific information for a restaurateur. And uh, Matt, why don't you give us, a, if you want, uh, how can uh, perhaps one of our viewers contact you if they wanted to? I'm going to put it in the chat, my email. No, just say it so that uh, the people watching on YouTube might want. There he goes. There he goes. There you yeah. go. It's Matt, M-A-T-T, -T, two T's, at IT Fusion, which is right above my head. Right. IT Fusion Tech, T-E-C-H dot com. Or our office number is 954-900-1654. Okay. Well, I, again, I appreciate you coming in. I thank everybody for coming today. Yeah. And uh, we'll see you next week. Okay. Uh, have a safe and happy week. And I'll keep this window open if anybody wants to hang around.